In late summer 2021, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, released its climate report. I remember going for an early morning walk that day while I listened to a news podcast break down the findings of the report, and it was dire. The report warned that the planet would likely reach uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit of warming within just the next two decades, with a potential overshoot of 1.6 degrees Celsius between 2041 and 2060, due to human influence that had warmed the atmosphere, the ocean, and the land. And this meant that many of the observed changes that we saw in extremes, such as heat waves and heavy precipitation, droughts, and tropical cyclones, would only get more extreme. I left that walk in tears. I couldn't stop thinking that the entirety of my youth and well into my adulthood would be spent in fear of the irreversible damage done to the planet due to the decisions of greedy lobbyists and ineffectual politicians who made these decisions well before my birth and who were guaranteed to never live long enough to see the ramifications of their actions, or in most cases, in action, leaving the worst of these consequences to be dealt with by generations following them. Again, this realization was soul crushing, and it drove me far past the point of climate anxiety and well into climate despair or depression, really. I felt so powerless and hopeless, and in my grief, I sought out other forms of people who felt just as terrible as I did. And I would have stayed in that mental pit of suffering if I didn't, one, find actionable solutions to get involved with the climate crisis, and two, if I didn't have environmentalist art and music to turn to from people who not only gave a shit, but had the platforms to raise awareness and help in ways that I couldn't. And it's through reflecting on this time that it got me thinking about the history of climate activist music and what role musicians and songs have in raising awareness for and influencing change in climate action. But before getting into all of that, my name is Cher, and this is my art and commentary space. If you're new here, hi. Feel free to explore the rest of this channel after watching this video and see if you vibe with my content at all. I like to see my channel as a sort of grab bag of different topics that I like to cover, so just choose a video and see if that really like vibes with you. And if you're returning, hello, welcome. Always a pleasure to see you again. I really wanted to get this video out while it was still Earth Month and environmentalism is still more in the public consciousness. And I do know that this video started pretty heavy about the reality of climate change, but I think that it's really important to discuss. And I hope in discussing environmentalism, you can also find some hope on the horizon like I did. But with all that said, let's get into the video. While environmentalist music may seem like a recent phenomenon due to our increasing societal awareness of climate change, one of the earliest examples of songs in this genre actually dates back to 1837 with the song Woodman, Spare That Tree, written by George Pope Morris and Henry Russell. The song encapsulates much of the sentimentalism and romanticism of the transcendentalist movement, a movement that affirmed, among other things, the innate goodness of humans and divine beauty of nature, the latter of which was to be treated with the utmost respect. Songs with environmentalist themes in this era tended towards the classical music style, as opposed to popular tunes of the day, as romantic composers like Mozart and Beethoven provided a huge musical influence on those within the transcendentalist philosophy. Environmentalist songs over the next 100 years tended toward the more sentimental side than calls to activism or protest that we're more used to nowadays, as lyricists preferred the depictions of lush landscapes and wildlife, though these songs did inspire early conservationist and preservationist movements. With folk music's rise in the 1930s and 1940s, we began to hear songs about the American Midwestern Dust Bowl, such as Woody Guthrie's 1940 song, So Long It's Been Good to Know Ya, a song detailing the way that people interpreted the giant dust storms caused by intensive agricultural practices. It was with the folk music revival in the 1960s that environmentalist music really started to get its footing, and as Richard Kahn writes, this is due to its populist spirit, the tradition of protest rhetoric, and general reliance upon acoustic and even homespun instruments. Many saw folk music as the style that best fits and represents environmental movement. We then got the release of what is considered to be the first environmentalist album, titled God Bless This Grass, in 1966 by Peter Seeger, a musician and longtime collaborator with Woody Guthrie. As folk music and the environmental movement began to go mainstream, we would see artists like Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell blend both folk and environmentalist themes into their work, with Joni Mitchell penning pivotal songs like 1969's Big Yellow Taxi with lines like, You don't know what you've got till it's gone, they paved paradise and put up a parking lot on the song Woodstock a year later. Though more than folk, other forms of more popular music genres have more widely spread the message of environmental activism. A notable example in the rock genre is the Beach Boys, when they release songs like Don't Go Near the Water and A Day in the Life of a Tree that discuss pollution in the ocean and the air, respectively. Moving on to soul and R&B, we see the release of Mercy Mercy Me by Marvin Gaye. 
The song touched on the ways that environmentalism intersected with topics like feminism, inner city poverty, and black empowerment. One of the most well-known environmentalist songs, Earth Song, was released in 1995 by Michael Jackson and became a mega hit. The song's music video depicted images of animal cruelty, deforestation, pollution, poverty, and war. Strangely though, despite its massive global popularity, the song was never released in the US. In the years since the 1980s and 90s, massive pop figures had begun implementing environmentalist themes into their songs. And in the 2000s, I remember uh, the Smash Mouth song, Rockstar, the Smash Mouth song, All Star. But I also remember when I was younger, seeing the Disney's Friends for Change project in 2009, where various Disney Channel stars got together and like recorded a few songs to raise awareness for climate change. Does anyone else even remember that? But even more recently, we've had bands like Gorillaz with the Plastic Beach album, which among other things, addresses plastic pollution, as well as musician Donald Glover slash Childish Gambino with the song Feels Like Summer, which from the outset seems like a light song celebrating the season, brings us to the reality of the climate with lines like, every day gets hotter than the one before, running out of water it's about to go down go down air that kill the bees that we depend upon birds were made for singing waking up to no sound no sound as well as the artist marina formerly of the diamonds tackling climate change through the perspective of mother earth with the song purge the poison lyrics like quarantined all alone mother nature's on the phone what have you been doing don't forget i am your home virus come fires burn until human beings learn from every disaster you are not my master and while doing research for this video, I also came across the Norwegian musician Aurora, you may know from when she provided vocals for the movie Frozen 2, who had released multiple environmentalist singles and has been a climate activist for a number of years. Especially to us and our children, to all of us, you know, so it's such an unfair thing because we were just thrown into this world, a dying world. You know, all of us can be the a generations that killed the planet, or we can be the generation that actually fixed it and, and you know saved it for our future children and forever we will be the, gen the uh, generations like all of us that saved the planet and I would love to have that on our shoulders wouldn't you too? I first came across our 2019 single, The Seed, which illustrates a world where humanity's greed has used up all of our resources to the point that every tree has fallen and the rivers are poison. The song reminds us that we can't eat the money that we so desire to have and make more of, and it also reminds us to protect what actually sustains us, that being the planet that we live on. Hey, this is Editor Me just stopping by to say I, I can't believe that I left out the best climate activist song, uh, Little Dicky's magnum opus, um, Earth, starring Kanye West. Um, and I was just going to leave it out, but my roommate said that, you know, I absolutely need to address and talk about this really important song. So um, I guess this counts as me talking about it uh, in a section. Okay, that's it. <laughs> and with all this environmentalist music coming out, there has been a number of criticism, which we will touch on in the next section. Given the prevalence of environmentalist music in recent times, many concerns have been made about its sustainability. One example of such criticisms involves Live Earth, which is a one-off event developed to combat climate change. The event featured a series of benefit concerts featuring more than 150 musical acts made to raise money for charities committed to bringing about environmental awareness. While the event had a noble purpose, its execution faced some scrutiny. According to John Buckley of CarbonFootprint.com, the event's total carbon footprint, including the artists and spectators' travel and energy consumption, was probably at least 74,500 tons, more than 3,000 times the average Britain's annual footprint. It was also reported that many attendees left behind thousands of plastic cups, though they were urged to recycle. And though Live Earth was a one-off event, many of these criticisms have been turned to live music as a whole as well. There are musicians that have met this criticism head on though. One such band that comes to mind is the 1975, whose more recent band merch is made of upcycled, repurposed, older merch that's printed over with the latest album art. Bands are also encouraged to bring in their existing merch so that it can be reprinted over for free. The band also partnered with the nonprofit organization Reverb on one of their previous tours in an effort to reduce the environmental footprint. Hip hop band The Roots has also partnered with Reverb and has worked with providing carbon neutral events with actions like printing posters on reused paper and investing in renewable energy at carbon offsets. Music festivals like Bonnaroo, Coachella, and the Rainforest World Music Festival have also stepped up to make promises towards lowering their carbon emissions by encouraging people to recycle at venues with designated signs, as well as providing biodegradable packaging at shows. But though there is now a push to make promises towards more eco-friendly events and carbon offsets, this does bring into question how many of these groups or companies are partaking in a corporate greenwashing, and we have to be aware of what artist or company is engaging in climate-friendly actions in transparent and constructive ways. 
So I talked a bit at the beginning about the climate despair that I experienced and how I was able to overcome some of it, though definitely not all of it. Um, because this is definitely an ongoing situation. But before closing out this video, I want to touch on that as well as actual ways that you can help with the climate crisis. So the very first thing that I want to say is to stay aware and up to date on what climate science is saying. Things like the ice caps melting and increased uh, increased droughts or increased heat seem really scary because they are. That puts people off from doing further research uh, for their own mental health, which I totally get. But I think doing more research into the ways that we've actually improved can actually be more hopeful. At least I find it more hopeful. And I recently watched the video, We Will Fix Climate Change, on the Chris Gazat YouTube channel. And I think it not only effectively explained the effects of climate change, but also the solutions that have been implemented within the last decade has had a sizable effect on our carbon emissions. And again, I left this video having a little bit more hope for the future, as well as seeing what climate activists and climate scientists are doing to bring attention into the mainstream, who are even willing to risk their jobs just to improve our situation even a little bit. And going into those climate organizations, let's move into the next section, which is communal action. I think a common trap we fall into when thinking about the climate crisis is pushing a climate narrative that solely focuses on a set of individual changes rather than a communal effort. And while making personal changes like driving less, taking fewer airplane flights, or reducing overall consumption are admittedly good places to start, we have to remember that, according to one study, just 100 companies are responsible for 70% of the world's carbon emissions since 1988. So it's going to take more than taking fewer showers to combat that. Thankfully, we're not on this alone, and we have groups like the Sunrise Movement, for example, who advocate for initiatives like the Green New Deal and other climate infrastructure deals. The movement has hosted marches across the country in recent months to bring the Biden administration's attention to the problem, as well as reaching out to more than 6.5 million voters in the 2020 election. But if you're looking for ways to help in your immediate community, you can try joining things like local mutual aid groups that help communities cope with the impact of climate change, such as providing water and sunscreen during heat waves. Reaching out to your elected officials and putting pressure on them to support climate change initiatives is one of the best actions you can take. The Natural Resources Defense Council has a guide to lobbying to your legislator, which I'll link in the description below. Participating in community efforts like these not only help the climate initiative, but also provide fulfilling experiences as another way to ease up on the climate despair and climate depression that you may be experiencing. So the last thing I want to mention is that the fight for climate change is incredibly slow and it won't happen overnight. And it's important to remember that. So it's important to find resilience and think of the many other social change movements and how long it took to reach goals for, say, racism or reproductive rights, for example, and how far these issues still have to go. Things can seem so hopeless, so it's important to both make time for your climate grief as well as to find happiness when initiatives are pushed that help improve the situation. Well, I think that's going to do it for today's video. Of course, this topic goes way deeper than what I had time to research, but I encourage all of you guys to mention other environmentalist musicians or initiatives that I might have missed down in the comments below. Uh, feel free to follow me on my Twitter, on my Instagram. I also have links to my imprint and my Kofi if you feel so inclined to buy a print or a tip from me. But yeah, I think that's covered everything. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your Earth Month and are able to be outside as the weather slowly gets warmer. And don't forget to be appreciative of what our oh-so-sweet mother nature provides and i can't wait to see you all in the next video whenever that comes out bye <laughs>